we are live. And thank you and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I hope you feel as lucky as we do and for with you uh, joining us and us being with you. So um, this is the February meeting of the California High Speed Rail Authority's Board of Directors. Um, I, we're all sure that it's the 16th of February, so we're, we're where we are supposed to be this morning. Um, in between this, you don't, if you're not here, you don't see this, but I feel like we're in a football field because the audience is about on the other side of the field. We're down here. It has nothing to do with COVID, but we see no football players. So <laughs> next month, if we're here, we're going to move the chairs more close to uh, us. And you may not like that, but uh, that's what we're going to do. <laughs> so with that, uh, again, welcome. And um, we'll start uh, by calling uh, the roll. And uh, that is because the meeting is now in order. So uh, Mr. Secretary, if you'd call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director Shank. Present via Zoom. <laughs> Chair Richards. Here. Vice Chair Miller. Here. Assembly Member Arambula. Director Perea. Here. Director Gilmetti. Present. Director Escutia. Dir Director Williams. Here by Zoom. Director Pena. Here. Senator Gonzalez. Director Cohen. Present. We have a we have quorum. A quorum. Thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary. And uh, do we have a flag today? Is there one beyond? Oh, there's one over in the corner here. Thank you. Uh, if we'll ask uh, Director Perea if you could lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Be ready to salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, visible, and progressive and justice for all. Thank you. Um, I also want to thank, before we get started, we have. Uh, wanted to do this for some time. And I know for all the tech people out there, this is a no brainer, but uh, for my small brain, it was a big one. Uh, we now are able to have a meeting with some members in person. And if the member can't be in person, they are now virtual on Zoom. So it's a huge uh, benefit for all of us who are traveling from around the state to get here. Um, I would also, so I wanted to thank the IT people and Natalie Murphy who uh, shepherded all this to occur. Uh, before we start uh, public comments today, I want to uh, introduce uh, Director Emily Cohen. Uh, Emily is the Senior Vice President of, uh, how do we, what is it, Contractors, United Contractors, sorry, Emily. Uh, so she is, uh, she is responsible for uh, government relations, uh, public policy, advocacy, and eternal affairs, and we want to thank uh, uh, the Senate uh, pro tem, Senator Tony Atkins for the appointment. And uh, Emily, welcome. And uh, if you would like to make a comment or two, uh, only so long as it's not, I want to find the back door. Um, please. Not yet. Uh, no, I'm, I'm happy, happy to be here. I look forward to working with all of you and I extend my thanks to the pro tem and her team as well. Thank you. Thank you. We're happy to have you here, Emily. Um, and one final thing before we start our, our agenda, I, I want to um, I want to acknowledge and thank uh, Ernie Camacho. Uh, Ernie served on this board for six years, and um, he brought an invaluable uh, breadth of uh, experience and background uh, in facilities and construction management that really went a long way to helping uh, the authority and our board. Um, I would say about Ernie, uh, in addition to his service in, on the board and the Finance and Audit Committee, uh, I had, cannot remember one time in six years that uh, for the periods of time that I was in a position to be asking, he never said no. He was always stood up, came forward, provided invaluable uh, service uh, in side assignments, uh, as well as uh, something that I'll not forget, and that's the counsel he gave me over, over the period of time that he was here. Um, 
I can't say enough about him. I can't say enough about his commitment. And uh, I can only tell you that uh, in addition to what he's done, I am very, very honored that uh, we have become uh, good friends. And so uh, for Ernie Camacho, I'll uh, see you soon, compadre. So with Mr. that, we will now- um, Mr. Chairman, yes. Mr. Ch it's, uh, I'd like to- Director uh, Lynch, thank, sure. Th thank you. Uh, I certainly echo everything that you say about Ernie Camacho. Uh, the depth of his experience in construction for those of us like me who uh, is not from that industry, uh, his experience and most of all his wisdom will be sorely, sorely missed. And uh, as you say, he's become a good friend and uh, someone who cares deeply about this project. So whenever he would bring up issues that some of us didn't see or uh, didn't know about. It was always in the best interest of the project. And uh, I, I agree with you. I hope that I'm pleased to call him a friend and hope that uh, he will continue to uh, be available to be supportive of us. Thank you, Director Shank. All right. Um, <clears throat> Moving to our agenda this morning, I am going to make an adjustment. Uh, we will uh, hear the have the hearing on the uh, uh, engine, uh, rail engineering services uh, RFQ uh, second on the agenda today. Uh, the first thing we'll move to is public comment. And uh, Mr. Secretary, if you'll let the public know how they can address us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everybody. Before we begin public comment for the California High Speed Rail Board of Directors meeting, I would like to go over some important information for members of the public who have joined us in person to provide us comments. You will be called upon in the order we have received your card. If you are joining the meeting via Zoom and wish to provide public comment, please use the raise your hand feature located at the bottom of your screen. Or if you are dialing in by phone, pressing the number two will raise your hand and put you into the queue. Speakers will be called upon in the order their hands are raised. Once you are in the queue and your name is called, please click the prompt on the screen to allow your microphone to be unmuted. If you are joining us by phone, we will call on you by the last four digits of your phone number. At that point, you will hear a message that your phone is being unmuted. Each speaker will be given two minutes to speak. I will interrupt when you have 15 seconds remaining. When it is your turn to speak, please slowly and clearly say your first and last name and if applicable, state the organization you represent. Mr. S Mr. Chair, we will begin with the in-person speakers. Our first speaker is Keith Dunn. Good morning, Mr. Dunn. Well, there you are. All right. Yeah, he's on the end zone. <laughs> well, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I did play football in college, but I was the guy trying to tackle the people trying to get the end zone. So a little more comfortable with the, the tackle than the block. Uh, I'm here today. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. I, you know, I'm here for the Association for California High Speed Trains, as well as the District Council of Ironworkers of the state of California in the vicinity. I want to congratulate you on the 10,000 jobs that were created and celebrated in the Valley the other day. It's a, it's a milestone. It's important. It's a lifeline for many of our workers uh, and the iron workers that, that keeps their families going and, and adds a lot to the Central Valley and the economy there. Jobs are important, but, but you know, jobs are only as good as they are. And, and what really matters is the quality of life, the quality of life for our families. And you know, this project uh, is a project that is a solutions-oriented effort. We get kicked around. We hear a lot about existential threats to not only our state, uh, which is an easy thing to quantify when you look at the fires and the floods and all the different things that take place in California. Climate change is real. We all know that. We throw around the word existential threat a lot. I remember in college when I had my first course on existentialism and waiting for Godot and Beckett, and I was like, what the hell is all this? You get a little older, you start to understand some of those things. Existential threat is a, is, is a real threat to our state and our livelihood, and that's what matters. And that's why numbers are great. 10,000 is great. We're going to have more jobs, 
but numbers aren't the, the reason that we're moving forward with this project. This project is an answer to an existential threat. And, and I take that from our former governor who really knew how to talk about this, uh, an existential threat to our existence and our livelihoods here in safety in this state. So I applaud the 10,000 jobs. This project is going to be the largest single reducer of climate emissions in the transportation industry. Thank you. Uh, in the state, uh, let's not get lost in the numbers. We need to move forward with this program to create jobs, which again, with the iron workers and uh, the work that I do, it's very important and critical, but it's also critically important to the livelihood and the safety of Gosh. our families that we move forward with this program and address this existential threat moving forward. So thank you. I look forward to continue to support this program and your efforts to complete the Valley and eventually move from San Francisco to Los Angeles. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. And uh, Mr. Secretary, please note that uh, uh, Director Escushi is now with us. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mike West. Good morning, sir, and welcome. Good morning, Mike West, on behalf of the State Building and Construction Trades Council. Mr. Chair and members of the authority, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm here today to express gratitude for your work, Chief Executive Officer Kelly's work, and all the staff of the authority on making the dream of high-speed rail a reality. <clears throat> like, any, <clears throat> like any large public works project that takes years to complete, um, Costs rise from raw materials to inflation. There are many cost variables on a project of this scope. However, there is no time. There is no reason to pull back now. The longer we wait to complete this project, the more it will cost. In the meantime, the project is delivering real economic benefits to areas of the state that need it most. The authority celebrated, as Mr. Dunn said, the 10,000th construction job created on this project earlier this week. This is the largest public works project in generations in California. These jobs are not just jobs, but life-changing careers for the construction workers and apprentices who have them. Furthermore, data shows that it will be nearly impossible to meet the state's ambitious GHG reduction goals without a robust and efficient high-speed rail system connecting the broader and far-reaching public transit network. Now is not the time to delay. We must keep going. We urge the authority to push forward and make the dream of high-speed rail system a reality for the state of California and the thousands of workers who, whose lives this project will change for the better. The rest of the world has done this. Why can't we? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. West. Our next speaker is Laura Uden. Good morning, Ms. Ms. Uden, and I've uh, consented to agree, uh, to provide an additional couple minutes for uh, Ms. Uden. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Board. <clears throat> uh, I, I represent disabled veterans across firms across the country that want to work on high-speed rail program. I'm the president of the Bay Area chapter of the U.S. Veterans Business Alliance and the owner of a small disadvantaged and disabled veteran firm. I'm also the chair of the Professional Services Committee on the High-Speed Rail Business Advisory Council, I've been a member of that council for almost a decade, working on behalf of small business owners, trying to improve utilization of small disadvantaged and disabled veteran businesses on the program, including helping address the issues of fair treatment and prompt payment. We appreciate the support of the authority executive team on these issues and look forward to continued meetings with them. I really wanna say that because we're starting our meetings back up. Thank you, CEO Kelly, I really appreciate that. I wanted to speak about two things today, the High-Speed Rail Authority's conflict of interest policy and board members. On the conflict of interest policy, I provided comments as did others on the authority's proposed revisions. We met with some board members and authority management to discuss our suggestions on behalf of small businesses trying to navigate the conflict of interest determination process. I remain hopeful that our suggestions can be implemented to clarify and simplify that process. And I especially wanna thank Director Miller and Director Scuccia for their interest in, and support of our efforts, which we hope will result in positive changes. So thank you for those meetings, they helped a lot. On board membership, I've spoken with many other small business owners and we have serious concerns about the removal of Mr. Camacho from the board. We did not hear of any particular reasoning behind his removal, except possibly Senator Atkins' displeasure with the person who appointed him. While many of us vehemently disagreed with the actions of Mr. DeLeon, removing the many board members he appointed 
who have served the public, including Senator Atkins' own constituents, is not a helpful response to the situation. It's simply punishing those board members along with the people they serve, and we are the people they serve. Mr. Camacho has been a staunch supporter of small businesses on the program, as well as being the only board member originating from the construction industry. We appreciate the appointment of uh, Director Cohen, who has also a construction background, but Mr. Camacho's extensive experience of six years on this program, combined with his decades of experience in the industry, is difficult to replace. And his support of the board members learning in the, about the construction industry, industry has been invaluable. <laughs> Excuse me. While we truly appreciate the efforts of the board to help small business succeed on the program, Mr. Camacho was the only one who truly could understand our concerns from the perspective of the industry. He's helped many small businesses personally with issues impacting the ability to compete on the program and to address payment problems and other issues that they faced once working on the program. He was directly working with many small businesses on some of their concerns and now he's gone. His removal will damage small businesses in general across the program and will injure specific small firms that he was assisting with their issues. I wanted to appreciate Mr. Camacho for his tireless efforts on our behalf and the voice the concerns of many small business owners across the state on what appears to be an arbitrary decision that will impact our success as business owners. Many business advisory council members included Senator Atkins in a letter in December of 2021 asking for help in addressing small business issues on the high-speed rail program, but received no response from her office. I also reached out to the Senator's office last week about the remo removal of Mr. Camacho from the board, but again, received no reply. We strongly suggest this decision be rescinded and that Mr. Camacho be returned to his role so he can continue to add significant value to both the program and us as small business owners. Thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Ms. Uden, and uh, not to be responsive to you, but just to the public. Um, first of all, just so you do know, and it might give you some comfort, uh, Jim Gometti has been in the construction business for longer than most of us have been alive. Um, <laughs> I don't mean that in a disparaging sort of way, Jim, but I want to point out that um, this is nothing new for you. And, and um, so I, I want people to have comfort that there are people on this board that uh, have construction and development experience. Um, our new board member, uh, Emily Cohen uh, works for an organization and is very close to uh, large infrastructure projects uh, in her career. Um, I'll not say much. I have been in construction and development for, uh, I hate to say, 40 years. So uh, this is all I've done in my adult life, including building lots of houses, shopping centers, industrial buildings, and a number of other things also. So. We uh, are very focused on construction on this board and the costs associated and the people that we deal with in the construction industry, lots of small subcontractors, probably more than any large infrastructure. So we're very, we're very sensitive to it. And uh, I appreciate your comments. I just don't want anybody to get the sense that the, uh, the appointments here are, are ones that are not have some qualification qualification and everybody brings something to the board. Um, I would say that that uh, I don't think there was any ret retribution. I don't I'm unaware of it with regards to Mr. Camacho. I think this, the pro tem had cause to do whatever she wants to do. This is her responsibility. And uh, I'm very pleased with the appointment that she's made. So um, we're looking forward to moving forward. And I can promise you that I will rely upon and call on Ernie Camacho probably more often than any of you would pop, probably know. But um, anyway, thank you very much for your comments. May I comment as well? Please. Um, thank you for your comments. Um, and I've enjoyed working with you over this past year, and it might even be two. I, you know, with COVID, we've all lost a little bit track of time. But I want you to know that. Um, while I will miss Ernie because I enjoyed talking with him and working with him, even though we sometimes did not always agree on a, an approach, um, he was a gentleman and he was um, a very invaluable member of the community, of our board and our community. But that does not negate the fact that we have a new board member that I'm looking forward to working with as well. And change happens on this board quite a bit. And we just need to be um, aware of that and confident that those prior board members are still involved. I talked with Ernie myself last week and we'll continue to do that. But um, I want to say my personal 
you know, welcome to this board and, and we look forward to working with you. Thanks. All right, who's uh, up next, uh, Mr. Secretary? Um, that is all the public speakers we have in person. We will now move to the Zoom participants. All right. Once again, if you are joining the meeting via Zoom and wish to provide public comment, please raise, please use the raise your hand feature located at the bottom of your screen. Or if you're dialing in by phone, pressing the number two will raise your hand and put you into the queue. Speakers will be called upon in the order that their hands are raised. Once you are in the queue and your name is called, please click the prompt at the bottom of your screen to allow the microphone to be unmuted. If you are joining the, by phone, we will, call, we will call on you by the last four digits of your phone number. At that point, you will hear that your phone is being unmuted. Mr. Chairman, our first speaker is Roland Lebrun. Good morning, Mr. Lebrun. Mr. LeBron. Good morning, Chair. Good morning. Can you hear me? We hear you loud and clear. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Good morning, Chair Richard, uh, board members. Um, I would like to start by echo echoing uh, your and Di Director Schenck's comment about Dir Director Camacho. He will be sorely missed. Next, thank you for addressing the depletion of $4 billion in risk contingency. But I hope that you will agree that the recommendations of the Audit Office did not fully address the issue, specifically how your executive team somehow managed to let this fly under the radar until it was reported by a member of the public, and what actions will be taken to ensure that this does not happen again in the future. My final comment relates to Mr. Kelly's vague comment about relocating utilities and conflicts with PG&E and Union Pacific in CP1. Instead of having a frank and open discussion about the, Fres the Fresno Trench disaster, specifically why the authority ever considered cutting a 200 mile an hour trench right through what has been the de facto Central Valley Y for over a century, including 20 miles of track of tracks aimed directly at Hollister and Silicon Valley via Panache Pass. In closing, I look forward to the governor's appointment of the new inspector general, who will hopefully take a less dismissive approach to members of the public's letters and testimony, starting with my letter and comments at the June 2019 board meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. LeBron. Our next speaker is Andy Kuntz. Hi. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Good morning. Hi, I'm Andy Coons, president of the U.S. High Speed Rail Association. I want to com compliment the board and all the public officials who have stood behind this project. It is the most visionary project in the country. It's our first foray into building true high speed rail. Catch us up with the rest of the world. Uh, more than 20 nations have high speed rail, and it's proven successful in every nation that it's built. And we're very excited that this is finally taking shape in the country. And uh, once again, thank you so much for all of y'all's hard work and leadership on this important project. Thank you, sir. Our next speaker is Dan Levitt. Good morning, Mr. Levitt. Good morning, Chair Richards and members of the board. Um, I'm Dan Levitt with the San Joaquin Regional Rail Commission and the San Joaquin Joint Powers Authorities. We uh, manage both the ACE and San Joaquin's passenger rail services. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate you on reaching your historic 10,000 labor jobs milestone. And uh, then just to report that my agencies have been working with your staff and, and the ETO on inputs from our services to assist with your project update report. In addition, we're, we're continuing to work with your staff on integrating our services with high-speed rail both ACE and San Joaquin services will directly connect with High Speed Rail and your early operating segment at a multimodal hub station in downtown Merced. And we just uh, initiated key environmental and engineering work needed to connect the San Joaquins to your station. And we do appreciate your staff's help with that effort. Uh, finally, just want to let you know we greatly appreciate all your efforts on this vitally important project for California's future. And we look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you, Dan. 
Our next speaker is Karen Go. Karen who? Good morning, Chair Richards and member of the Authority Board. I'm Karen Go, Mayor, morning, of, Mayor. of Bakersfield. Good morning, Chair. California's ninth largest city where we feed and power the world. Thank you so much, Chair Richards, for traveling to Bakersfield in August to meet with the current Council of Governments and with me. With the legislature having released funding in this year's budget and an agreement in development for a station designer, we recognize it's game time in Bakersfield. As I shared, shared with you, Chair Richards, we're looking forward to a truly world-class station in Bakersfield. Our city is beginning to plan and prepare for the impacts of the station on our community. In 2018, the city worked closely with the authority to complete a station area plan. Chester Avenue, which runs through downtown Bakersfield to the station site, was displayed prominently throughout the plan. The plan presented includes the first two phases of the station. More specifically, the plan recommends prioritizing complete street improvements to Chester Avenue during the design phase of the station. Bakersfield has a shovel-ready transformative project along Chester Avenue. This project provides for the construction of a truly complete street designed specifically to connect disadvantaged neighborhoods and businesses to downtown Bakersfield and the future high-speed rail station site. The city is finalizing a federal raise grant application. I sent a letter to the board and staff seeking a letter of support. Thank you to staff for reaching out to me this week, and I look forward to discussing the investments that will be made on the station site and how we can plan for the impacts of construction and land acquisition on the city of Bakersfield. Thank you so much again, Chair Richards and members of the board for your time. And thank you, Mayor, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing uh, you, uh, uh, CEO Kelly and myself uh, in early March. Our next speaker is Dean DeVita. Good afternoon. My name is, how are you today? Good, thank you. My name is Dean DeVita. I'm the president of the National Conference of Firemen and Olas, SCIU. I just want to congratulate this committee on the work you've been doing. Uh, this project is, is going to lead the way for many projects of this kind throughout our country. This this is amazing that you, you've reached the 10,000 worker goal uh, this past week. And I just want to take time and congratulate you, but I also want to congratulate the workers and all the other workers behind them who are enjoying that employment that they are, are receiving right now and their families. You know, when they build these trains stations and, and, and these lines, it generates more work than just the employee that's hired to build the construction of the, the railway or the railroad worker who will be working on it one day. There will be uh, cities built around the train stations, office buildings, residential buildings, hospitals, doctor's office, uh, TV stations, all kinds of things. Uh, and, and most important, schools and libraries. So I really want to tell you, I appreciate the work you're doing and we'll support you every way we can. And congratulations and continue this great success that you're enjoying. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair, we have no other attendees that would like to provide public comment. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary. And uh, with that then, ladies and gentlemen, the public uh, comments portion of this meeting is uh, completed. Uh, we will now move to our agenda items. Item number one, uh, the meeting minutes for November of uh, 2022. Do we have a motion for approval? Second. Second. Uh, please call the roll. Director Shank. Yes. Chair Richards. Yes. Vice Chair Miller. I'm abstaining. I was not in attendance. Director Perea. Yes. Director Gilmetti? Yes. Director Escutia? Aye. Director Williams? Abstain. Director Pena? Yes. Director Cohen? Abstain. I wasn't a board member. 
<clears throat> Do I have enough Chair, the motion carries. Okay, thank you. Uh, and now we will uh, jump out of the order of the agenda. We're going to move to um, item uh, number four, uh, number four, which is to consider providing approval of the release of the request for qualifications for the rail systems engineering services contract. Mr. Armistead, good morning. I'm here to ask that you approve the Rail Systems Engineering Services request for qualifications. Can you move the microphone a little bit closer, closer to you? There you go. Okay. Is that better? Uh, sure. Okay. <laughs> Either that or take a four, three or four inches off of your height. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> Whichever is easier. <laughs> Here's some background on the uh, draft contract term and conditions. The current rail systems engineering services are provided by <laughs> rail delivery partner contract. The rail systems engineering scope is not included in the current PDS contract. The PDS contract is the successor to the RDP contract. Management of the RESIS contract will be under the authority's rail operations and delivery branch. The term of the contract will be approximately five years and four months. And the estimated cost is 73.2. So qualifications-based procurement, which means that we'll have fair and reasonable costs that will be negotiated with the top offer uh, prior to executing the contract. Small business utilization goals are shown there along with DBE and disadvantaged business enterprise utilization goals. The rail systems engineering, oops. There's a little delay. The Rail Systems Engineering Consultant will uh, provide a core group of engineers to support the authority in a partner role with expertise in tracking systems, signaling and train control, station in integration, and other things. They will review all the civil designs to ensure compliance with the authority's design criteria manual. Also make sure that the tracking systems uh, requirements are met through our verification and validation processes. They'll assure that no elements in the rail construction, the civil construction, would interfere with the rail construction, rail maintenance, and rail operations. They'll respond to special requests for technical evaluations, which arise beyond the construction and plan reviews uh, as the environmental documents are prepared and preliminary designs are uh, submitted. Support the authority's integration of elements of all the rail system, and they will manage those design inter interfaces. Provide support to the civil tracking systems elements for train sets and stations. They'll manage the risk register and system safety for all the safety cases related to the civil works, tracking systems, trains, and stations. Some background revenue certification, the rail systems engineering consultant is critical to support our certification efforts. Our high speed rail project will be certified as a railroad that is ready for passenger service from Merced to Bakersfield, then eventually extending to LA to San Francisco. The authority has active construction on the first 119 mile segment. The track and systems contractors will follow that, will follow the civils and train sets, a train set certification facility and a heavy maintenance facility will also be constructed. A little background on European norms. The EU's reg regulatory approach in the past, the 27 countries that make up the EU set their own railroad standards. For example, a train designed and certified for operation in Germany would not necessarily be certified to operate in France. Subsequently, the EU developed standards, regulations, and a formal process that allowed the interoperability throughout the European Union. These include technical specifications for interoperability or the TSIs. They also came up with European normatives, the ENs we call them, these are specific specifications for the and demonstration of reliability, availability, maintainability, and safety. That one's EN 50126. 
There's also EN 50128 and 129 that cover software signaling, communications, and process control. The FRA approach, these rules of general applicability are established in the CFRs. These are primarily design-based regulations that universally apply to all railroads in the US. The published rules may not adequately cover innovations and the FRA will allow for rules of, of particular applicability. Such rules are only applicable to specifically identified application in the RPA. Safety cases, risk assessments, hazard assessments, and mitigations are all benchmarked against these regulatory requirements. Contracts to be supported by a rail systems engineering consultant. The track, systems, train sets, stations, and construction management of the rail contracts. These contracts are detailed as we, as we see here. This chart is best read from the bottom up. The train, set, the train set contract will be responsible for train set manufacturing, design of the train set maintenance facilities, all testing and commissioning, commissioning of the rolling stock. The track and systems contract will be, design, will be responsible for the design, manufacturing, construction, and installation of all the track and systems elements. So these contracts will be responsible for make, doing everything that makes the train go on top of the civil works that are currently being constructed. Our construction manager, when we bring them on, will be responsible for all the site safety and security, the construction oversight, they'll support us in our certifications and the integration support along with construction man with um, contract management support. And our rail system engineering services contract will provide asset management support. They'll help assist us with the certification, as I mentioned, integration, and they'll provide us with rail engineers that will help us to oversee and verify that the track and systems, rolling stock, and civil works all meet our design requirements. And, all, and the authority is responsible for uh, contract management of all the contracts. So all these contracts will report to the authority and we'll have state employees in the appropriate roles for managing these contracts. So we essentially, the authority will hold the paper for the rail systems and engineering contract, we'll hold the paper for construction management, we'll hold the paper for track and systems and the train sets. And the rail systems engineer will help us with managing the interfaces of all those designs and the installations. A little more about entry into passenger service. This chart is also best read from the bottom up. The system readiness, train readiness, track and systems and stations and civil designs, those will all culminate in our system readiness package. That will include a safety plan with case and tests and the technical, technical documentation that shows objective evidence of all of our requirements being, mess, being met. So that safety case will represent our system readiness. Operational readiness, we'll have maintenance readiness, administrative readiness, which will uh, assure that the train operating company that we develop will be ready to run a revenue service. We'll have emergency readiness and uh, safety cases on the operational side, along with training and our operating rules and procedures. That will then lead us to our trial running. And at the trial running phase, we'll operate a service schedule that includes maintenance response drills and uh, degraded mode operations for our service. So we'll run these drills, we'll run in degraded modes, make sure that all of our response plans, safety plans and uh, procedures are all in order for us to run a service safely. That will culminate in a revenue service, a ready for revenue service certificate. So we'll accept the railway after we have the system readiness done, the safety cases all completed, the operational readiness done, then we'll trial run for about a year, a service schedule. We'll go through the emergency drills, emergency responders, we'll respond to certain events and we'll make sure that our drills and plans are ready. 
and we'll have a trial run committee that includes regulatory agencies and authority representatives. Their safety then will receive a safety certification trial run completion certificate by the rail authority. And in this country, it's the Federal Railroad Administration. Once we receive that certification that we're ready to run revenue service, then we'll enter into passenger service, enter into high speed passenger service. Back to the contract. So the rail systems engineering will be our support throughout this process when we get to, in order for us to get to revenue service. And as I mentioned earlier, they will support us in the in integrations and reviewing the safety cases, et cetera. Our evaluation of the statement of qualifications will be scored by an evaluation committee pursuant to the requirements established in the RFQ. Pre-award audits will be conducted to assure that uh, negotiate, well, pre-award audits will be conducted to assure that the labor rates that are in the are in the proposals, cost proposals are consistent with market standards. Environmental, social, and governance, eff governance efforts, which may include any environmental sustainability efforts, socioeconomically, socioeconomic equity policies, governance policies, or report will be incorporated as a pass fail requirement for our RFQ. This is, our this is our procurement schedule. Uh, if approved today, we'd like to release the RFP, RFQ tomorrow. We'll have a virtual pre-bid conference and small business informational workshop on March 7th. SOQs will be due on May 2nd. We'll, have a, we'll be ready to issue an anticipated notice of proposed award in May of, of May 2023. We'll be coming back to this body for approval of a contract and execution in July of 2023. And at this time, I'd like to try and answer any questions that you may have. I have a question, Mr. Chairman. This is Martha Scutia. Go ahead, Director Scutia. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Arnestad. It was a very uh, informative slide. I really appreciate the visual aspect of this. Um, I, if I can ask the secretary to go back to page nine of the slide presentation. Thank you. Now, Obviously, you know, the train sets, that's going to be a different contract that I guess someday we will approve. Same thing with tracking systems, construction management. So basically, the way I interpret this chart, Mr. Arnestad, is that the rail systems engineering services contract is basically going to gather everything that comes pursuant to the train sets, tracking systems, and construction management. I suppose analyze it and then present that to the authority. Is that correct? Loosely, yes, that is correct. Do you don't you think that's a lot of work? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. But the way the the European normatives are set up is that we have a verifier and a checker. And just looking at this slide in in instances oh. where the construction management organization would be checking the designs of the track and systems contractor to assure that the designs meet our requirements, then the rail systems engineering services contractor would verify that the construction manager has provided the objective evidence that meets our requirements. And yes, it is a lot of work. Our rail systems engineering group will be the, uh, our arm for verifying and checking all the requirements along with assuring that the safety cases are prepared in a proper way for us to meet revenue service requirements. And I will say in other uh, rail organizations, these groups uh, are very large and in mature railroads, they number in the hundreds of people. Okay, so basically what you're saying is that whoever gets this contract for rail systems engineering is we'll probably have you know a lot of a lot of people to do all this work, but at the same time, to have enough staff to constantly evaluate 
uh, what needs to be done, obviously, in a safe manner. Uh, is that correct? Yes, it is. So with regard to evaluation and the constant evaluation, which I think is critical, um, I just want to make sure that for diverse contracting requirements, that that evaluation in terms of the diversity of, of the subcontractors is a constant. You know, I read somewhere in your slides that that they're going to be graded on a pass fail uh, pursuant to the RFQ. Uh, what happens after that? They're not evaluated that they're making that they're you know honoring their commitments to diverse contracting. Oh, abso abso absolutely, absolutely. Our uh, contract management rules say that we do a contract compliance audit every year of our contractors. So we look at them to make sure we look at their performance to assure that they're being uh, cons consistent with our requirements of the contract for meeting all of the clauses in the contract, not just their diversity requirements. And we make re we review and make judgments based on those requirements if we we're going to continue or what corrective action may be necessary for us to assure that that contractor meets their goals. All right. So, I mean, I'm glad to hear that because I wouldn't want, you know, diverse contracting goals to fall down the wayside for lack of, you know, um, evaluation on our part. So I'm glad to hear that you're going to be auditing this firm uh, at least once a year. Uh, thank you for saying that. And then lastly, just for my edification, and I'm, I'm a fairly new board member. I've only been here for three years. Um, is this contract basically the one to replace WSP? They will replace a portion of WSP. The PDS contractor has the lion's share of the rail system of the RDP, rail delivery partner contract. This is our rail systems piece, which is our task three to get into too much detail. Uh, this is our task for all the rail systems engineering, including the asset management and all the things that, as I said, make the train go. So okay, this will and, be the only, and the only reason why I'm asking that question is because I'm concerned about transition, you know, to go from say WSP to whoever gets this, whoever gets this RFP. But it sounds like if there's still going to be a group of persons associated with WSP that Will they be able to assist in this new contract? That, that's a that's a very good point. We would be we've timed the uh, offboarding of the WSP process contractor to match with a with the onboarding of the new Rhesus contractor. So there'll be an overlap of three to six months depending okay. on the successful proposer. So we'll have a, and they're also going through this right now with PDS and, and the new RDP, I mean the new PDS old RDP, where they are duplications of roles until there's a level of competence that this person can now be released. And in some cases, there are employment changes that are made. Some, sometimes the employee for the previous company now comes to work for the other company. And that's can, common in, in, right. in large projects. And from what I've been hearing about this industry, there's a lot of interaction with different, you know, stakeholders, and I, I understand it. Um, I'm glad to hear about the opportunity for transition. I'm glad to hear about the overlap between offboarding and onboarding. And thank you very much, uh, Mr. Armistad, for, for your direct answers to my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Director Scushi. Any other uh, questions from uh, members of the board? I have yes. one. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, with respect to the question that's always asked, is when will trains be running? Uh, how do you back into that by one, when will the RFPs go out for the tracking systems and for the train set? And how does that tie into that? When will trains be running? Well, Mr. Kelly is going to go through a little bit of the, uh, of the, uh, project update report, which includes schedule, but I will say we do a, uh, we just, uh, typically the way it's done is you look at your revenue service date, and then you back off of that for trial running, then you back off of that for dynamic testing, and then you back off of that for your static testing. And then at some point during that time, you have to have the delivery of the train sets in order to do your static and dynamic testing. And that's, that is time with the understanding that we have to be in revenue service by a certain date. So right. we have to have the train sets by a date prior to that mm -hmm. in order to complete 
the dynamic testing. But it will be your operation that will be leading the <clears throat> leading the charge in that effort. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. Any other any other questions for Mr. Armistead? Move approval. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, please call the roll. Director Shank. Yes. Chair Richards. Yes. Vice Chair Miller. Yes. Director Perea. Yes. Director Gilmetti. Yes. Director Escutia. Aye. Director Williams. Aye. Director Pena. Director Cohen. Yes. Mr. Chair, the motion carries. Thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary, and uh, thank you, Mr. Armistead, very much. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're now going to move back uh, to what was the CEO report at number two and is now number three. Good morning, Mr. Kelly. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, board members. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to address you this morning. Um, as I do every month, I have a CEO report, will, which will update various parts of our uh, program, uh, uh, things that we've uh, done between the last meeting and, and, and this one. Uh, but this is also uh, an opportunity to update you on where we are in a broader issue, which is, um, as, as you all know, each odd numbered year, uh, we submit to the legislature a, a project update report that is due on March 1st. Uh, typically, uh, we uh, present that report directly to the uh, legislature from the authority, and uh, it's like a, sort of a standard uh, a report that's often due from agencies to, uh, to the legislature. Uh, this year's project update report is a little bit uh, different. It's much more weighty. Uh, there are uh, things we said in the 2022 business plan that we were going to update in this report, and um, and then when the budget bill passed last year, the legislature added additional requirements. So because of many of the issues that are uh, gonna be reported on March 1st, I thought in discussing with the, the chairman that we thought it was a, a good opportunity and a, and a good idea to talk about some of these things in advance of the March 1st submittal uh, to the legislature. So I'm gonna start my CEO report with a summary of that project update report. Um, and then I will get into other program updates. At the end, I will certainly stop and answer questions first about the PUR, uh, and then I'll move into other parts of the, the program. Okay. Let me see if I can start this. Here we go. Oops. Sorry, guys, there's a little delay in the, uh... okay. So uh, first it's worth um, starting with where we jumped off with the 22 business plan. When we uh, passed the 2022 business plan and that process is very different. That involves a, a draft period where we put out a draft of the plan. We take public comment on that draft and we make changes and, uh, and then we, we submit it to the, to the legislature. Again, the PER is different. But the 22 business plan, there were several things that we uh, left for the 2023 project update report to cover. The first is we talked about in the 22 business plan, getting our scope definition uh, clearer uh, so that we can update uh, costs, schedules, and uh, scope for the Merced to Bakersfield stretch and, and really the entirety of the program. We identified in that 22 business plan seven or eight major commercial issues on CP1 four on CP23 and one on CP4 that we were in negotiations on and we had to work through and complete those negotiations. As I'm standing here today, seven of the eight have been concluded on CP1, three of four are done on CP23 and, uh, and the one major commercial issue on four was uh, concluded some time ago. Uh, with that conclusion, we get better scope uh, definition of the project. And we also said we'd therefore update our revised baseline schedules. Uh, you may remember I reported to the board on the baseline schedules for the construction segment in August and again in November of 2022. For CP1, our conclusion date is 2026, the same for CP23. And for CP4, 
Um, that will reach substantial completion later this year, looking at the end of quarter two, June or perhaps July of 2023. We also, as I said, committed in the business plan to reset our budgets, uh, not just for the 119 miles, but with a greater defined scope and a fuller budget with higher risk prob probabilities uh, contained in it for the Merced to Bakersfield stretch. So we've, we've done that as well as we head into this project update report. And of course, we update our capital costs uh, for all of phase one. And our practice here at the authority, at least since 2018, has been once the board completes the record of decision for various environmental segments, that's a time when we update the cost estimate for phase one. Uh, because having done that environmental document, we have a better sense of exactly what we're building. And we've agreed to and identified mitigation measures in those segments that often come with cost. And so as we commit to those mitigation measures, uh, we update the cost element when the rods are done. And that's, that's we've, we've completed two of those since the 22 business plan. And finally, we committed in the 22 business plan to update our ridership analysis. Uh, I just wanna say at the outset, this is preliminary. Uh, right now, our modeling team has worked with the California State Transportation Agency uh, and Caltrans, as well as uh, partners at other transit uh, entities uh, to update the ridership analysis and model uh, for, uh, for our program going forward. And really, it, it, it's related to transit ridership uh, generally, because uh, much of what we're saying we're accomplishing from a ridership perspective in the Valley is tied to the service that our connecting agencies uh, uh, operate as well. Uh, again, uh, what, so those are the things that we jumped off with in the 22 business plan. And then, of course, in July of 22, the legislature passed SB 198, which was the budget agreement that included uh, funding uh, $4.2 billion appropriated for our program out of the high-speed rail bond. And the legislature added some additional requirements to the project update report. The first, as I mentioned, uh, update cost and schedule estimates for the Merced to Bakersfield segment with specified milestones for completion and the stated risk and contingency assumptions. That's new for the project update report. And that really uh, had us all focus over the last several months on every scope element issue that's in the Merced uh, to Bakersfield stretch. When we last did our budget, there were some elements that were not yet concluded in terms of where certain stations would terminate, uh, exactly what uh, structure would be needed to get to those termination points those are much better, much better understood now, and they will be reflected in the project update report that we submit. The other element from the legislature was to uh, clear direction that we are to build, uh, this was in statute, to build a segment as a dual track electrified railroad with a shared station in Merced with passenger services that will operate north to Sacramento and west of the Bay Area. So they defined in statute where the uh, station location would be and, uh, and uh, define the cross-platform uh, connection to San Joaquin uh, Amtrak and the Altima Commuter Express. We also received additional input from the cities and other local partners for station design and location. You heard in the public comment period earlier today, the mayor of Bakersfield uh, called in and talked about the station location in Bakersfield. Uh, in our presentation last year in the budget bill, there was talk and discussion about an interim station location uh, that's now been dismissed, and we're at a firm station location in uh, in Bakersfield, and, and so the project update report reflects that. And of course, we learned a lot during 2022 on our track assistance procurement that we went out on, and we saw through that procurement a lot of instability in the marketplace post-COVID with respect to the highest inflation period in 40 years and some supply chain, uh, supply chain challenges. Uh, that uh, had us pull that track and system procurement and sort of reset and re-strategize how we're gonna approach it because we did see a lot of instability uh, in the marketplace. And you were probably hearing and seeing about that market stability affecting other mega projects and other transit systems in California. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Sorry, this is uh, jumping around a little bit. Okay, so the 2023 project update report, it starts with our target objective of a 20, 2030 operational goal by the end of 2030. And it reflects the scope, schedule, cost, and risk for that early operating segment 
with the target schedule for operations by the end of 2030. We do apply using the Federal Railroad uh, Authority, the Federal Railroad Administrations and the FTA guidelines on applying risk to that schedule, which we have applied to our schedule. And we have a schedule envelope of between 2030 and 2033 for operations to begin. Our largest single risk factor on our schedule is will be the availability of funding. We will have to make sure we have funding before we execute necessary contracts to get the work done. And that will be our largest risk factor as we look at the schedule going forward. The project update report has very credible estimates in it. These cost updates and risk analyses were conducted by experts to establish a budget at what we call a P65 or a probability 65 risk level, which means that your budget that you've established has a 65% chance of covering uh, the cost of the system. Uh, that standard is a standard that is in line with FRA and FTA guidelines, as well as the schedule envelope that we've developed. How did we do this? Well, this was a whole team effort. It started with guidance and direction from uh, me uh, and set out a plan with a timeline and deliverables. We conducted extensive workshops with department leads on scope, schedule, cost, and risk. And then we conducted reasonable checks on all of those things. Our cost estimates followed capital cost estimating guidance from both the federal and industry best practices, USDOT and the American Association of Civil Engineer Guidelines. Our risk process was conducted by the authority's independent risk advisors. And just to pause for a moment here, you may recall a couple of years ago, this board approved us uh, directly contracting for risk services. We entered a contract with Ernst & Young uh, to do that. We went out and brought in the risk expert that had been advising the Federal Railroad Administration before, and he now advises us directly. Uh, and that risk advisor was part of the team that looked at our risk and helped us set both Analyze, uh, analyzing the risk standards and setting our contingencies uh, to deal with the risk that's ahead. And finally, we worked with our financial advisor, KPMG, to do uh, uh, financial uh, reasonable ch reasonableness checks uh, on the estimates that we have in the project update report. What's the outcome and the result? Uh, it's a cost estimate range that is informed by risk for the early operating segment, and it meets all of the legislative requirements that were added uh, for the project update report for this year. So what's the outcome of this? Well, first I wanna talk a little bit about uh, where we are in the marketplace. Um, as I said earlier, we saw during our, uh, as we saw during our, um, our uh, 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 work last year on the procurement of the track and systems, the industry saw a lot of impact from the inflation and supply chain issues. Uh, I mentioned here as an example, the gateway project in New York which is a 10 mile, roughly $40 billion, uh, sorry, $16 billion, 10 mile uh, major rail improvement between New Jersey uh, and New York. They suffered 39% uh, budget increase. We saw similar impacts in this marketplace affecting uh, projects like the Trans Bay Tunnel in the Bay Area, the Caltrain electrification, Purple Line in Southern California. And so there was a lot of impact with the inflation supply chain issues on mega projects around the state and we are not immune from those impacts. Um, so the costs on our project in California as we project forward for this, um, we had estimated last year that uh, the entirety of the Merced to Bakersfield uh, stretch, uh, plus the uh, bookend projects we're doing in Northern so in Southern California, and all of the environmental documents that we were approving would cost about $25.7 billion. And those, those estimates are now up under our new risk uh, profile between about six and a half and $9.6 billion to uh, go through the risk probabilities on why there's a range. But we'll see those estimates and we will be reporting those estimates in the project update report on March 1st. There are three key parts that drive our costs. And I just wanna talk about those. One, as I stated earlier, we've seen all throughout the industry, the impacts of inflation and es escalation and for us, that's about 21% of the cost. So just updating the unit price of our, co our, our cost to build Merced to Bakersfield, we update to 2022 and we use a construction uh, materials index that is common for uh, construction uh, practices. Uh, and that alone showed a 21% increase. 
Then secondly, our escalation, which is the year over year percentage of growth with time in, in cost from the project. And uh, in our case, uh, our escalation factor has historically been 2%, but in this inflationary period, this year it's five and one third percent. And for the next several years, it'll be over 3%. Uh, eventually, after about year five, it'll come back down. We'll be back into roughly a 2% year-over-year estimate. Now, we use forecasts from the Department of Finance and from the Federal Reserve to, uh, to make those estimates. But again, that's a key impact on our cost differences between where we were and where we are. The second key issue is scope changes and increase. Um, and specifically, I mentioned earlier, um, there were elements of our program last year where we had some things undefined, particularly uh, the, the location of the big, uh, Burp, I'm sorry, Bakersfield uh, Station downtown on F Street. We had contemplated an interim stop before. Now uh, there's a fuller commitment to do all the way to the F Street Station. Those station elements include things like canopies and misters and platforms and escalators and access points. We're clearer on what elements would be a part of these stations. Again, it'll be part of our design process working with communities like Bakersfield. But understanding that scope, putting in the scope from the definition of the downtown Merced station, which is now statutory, uh, the scope changes added about 41% to the cost. The other thing I'll just say about scope is tied to the track and systems contract. Again, last year when we went out on track and systems, we had an estimate for costs. We saw the instability in the marketplace. We saw the inflationary impacts. And while we did not pursue that contract last year, for purposes of our cost estimating here, we are acknowledging that instability we saw and we're putting in our cost estimate going forward. So track and systems is, is, is up significantly. And then finally, we are meeting the probability 65 risk uh, 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 potential or probability. And, and, and to do that, we have to increase the contingency in our budget. And so to get to a P65 level, our risk contingencies are higher, and those uh, account for about 38% of the cost. So three areas, escalation, scope, and contingency for risk. Uh, there's real, oops, boy, this thing jumps. Sorry about that, guys. Okay. There's really two parts to the work that we're doing right now. Um, and I've talked to the board about this at length in the past, but it's, it's, I think it's valuable to understand. In one way, we are closing the door on the 119 miles that we have under construction right now. And that means, uh, as, as we've talked about at length, um, you know, the 119 mile, the start of that construction segment, and the sequencing of how that work began without the right of way done, without the utility relocations done, we're in a position where we've been playing catch up for the last several years. We've been working through getting the right of way finished getting the utilities relocated, getting all the designs and scope into the contracts. So then you can execute those contracts and move on from the 119. We're finally coming to the end of that process, but we have been paying for it for some time. And because it was out of sequence, uh, construction related delays have been uh, on us uh, because we're the parties responsible for right away and things like that. And where that's taken more time, uh, we're, we're, we've paid for that. And so. About 2.2 billion of our cost estimate here is closing the door on the 119 miles, just getting all of it done, escalating out into the completion dates out to 2026. The good news is we've made tremendous progress. Uh, about 72% of our utilities have either been relocated or in the process of being really relocated now. Uh, the right of way, which has been a long reported uh, problem or challenge on the 119 miles, now 96% of that is in hand. Right away is no longer a fundamental challenge or threat uh, for our, uh, our moving our pro program forward. We're almost done with the right away. Um, and all of the design for the structures uh, for the 119 miles are complete, 100%. So we have to work through third party agreements so we can finish moving those utilities. And then we'll work through the finalization of the construction work on the 119 miles again. The first construction package will be done in the second quarter of 2023. The other ones will complete at the very beginning and middle part of 2026. So that's that's part of it. Then the second part again is looking forward. Merced to Bakersfield doing these extensions. We're looking towards new procurements for civil constructions to Merced and Bakersfield, track and systems work, stations, and finally train sets. And we are already approaching the extensions differently than the 119 were approached. And there's 
a lot of reasons for why the 119 went the way it did. But what we're doing now is, is advancing the design on those extensions. We are now in that advanced design uh, period that will allow us to uh, conduct value engineering, do geotechnical work, uh, identify all the right of way that we need, develop a 100% right of way acquisition plan, identify the utilities that need to be moved, and make sure we do not start construction until that's done. Secondly, we will likely use smaller contracts going forward. Rather than waiting for stretches that are 30 or 60 or 22 miles long, uh, once the right of way is complete and utilities are moved, we will likely use smaller construction packages going forward to execute the work more quickly and manage the contracts more efficiently. And so that's our program going forward. And we've identified again going forward a cost range of about between four and a half and six and a half higher than where we were uh, for the uh, extensions to Merced and Bakersfield. This slide shows you the differences uh, that I mentioned on just the 119 mile uh, Central Valley segment. And I'd call your attention really here to the top row. Um, the second column is where we were in the 22 business plan. And you see the Central Valley civil construction was at 10.255 billion. When we uh, estimate, uh, estimated for the year of expenditure now and just brought up our, our, um, uh, our, our escalation factor, we got to 11.485. And then you see these P numbers on the rows that follow, P30, P50, P65. Those are the different risk probability levels on where the budget needs to be to finish that work in the Valley. So you see we added 2.2 to get through the civil construction at the P65 level. And again, that P65, it's not necessarily magical, but it's what the FRA and the Federal Transit Administration use as guidelines for mega projects like ours. More broadly on the Merced to Bakersfield early operating segment, it's the same uh, kind of thing. You see that the subtotal for the, just the Merced to Bakersfield about midway down on this chart in the business plan, we were at $23.4 billion. Uh, you see that's up when we just do the, the estimate of, the updated estimate of costs for uh, unit prices and things like that. And then again, we apply the risk factor. And as you go to the right, a P30 risk has that at 29 a P50 at 31.4, and a P65 at 32.976. One thing I'll call out on this chart just to be uh, to, to uh, clarify one issue is there's a, uh, just above that subtotal line, it says phase one transfer, and it references $1.719 billion, and then that, that's not carried over in the next row. Uh, we, we identified in the business plan that we did last uh, that there was about 1.719 billion in costs that um, we budgeted outside of the Merced to Bakersfield stretch because we hadn't concluded where the final Bakersfield station would be. We identified it as cost, but it wasn't in the budget for Merced to Bakersfield. Now that the station is declared and we know where it's gonna be, uh, we've moved that 1.719 uh, into the, the Merced to Bakersfield stretch. So it's sort of a little bit of an, an accounting move, but it recognizes that that scope is indeed in the Merced to Bakersfield stretch, not outside of it. And so it's covered in those red arrows on the right point to where that, where that 1.719 is, uh, is filled into the, the cost. So uh, more broadly, I said we update our phase one costs as well when we uh, finish our environmental documents. Since the business plan, this board has approved two additional uh, rods for uh, the state of California uh, for this project, rather, both the Merced to San Jose uh, segment and the San Francisco to San Jose segments were approved. So we update our, our cost estimates, plus the update with the Central Valley estimates that I just went through and the Merced to Bakersfield estimates. This is now what it looks like for all of phase one. Uh, we have a low, a base cost of 106, and then a high, which we generally report in every business plan uh, and in this business plan. So while there's no question that cost to build a 500 mile uh, electrified high speed train system is expensive uh, and, and there's a lot of zeros tied to that number, um, it's also true that uh, these costs are absolutely in line with international costs for high speed rail. And I wanna use this to just make the point. The high speed rail two project in Britain covers about 140 miles it carries a cost estimate of between 42 and $54 billion. 
and a completion date between 2029 and 2033. While that project differs from ours in some of the physical characteristics, it can be compared to our cost range of 29.8 to 33 for the 171 mile Merced to Bakersfield segment that we are proposing to build. And then secondly, uh, in all of our business plans, we update what we call a capacity analysis, which is comparing the cost of the high-speed rail system and the benefits you gain from that system versus other ways of achieving the same sort of transportation capacity benefits by expanding freeway lanes or expanding airports. The cost of doing that, those items is between 130 billion and 215 billion. And again, our high-speed rail cost range uh, comes in well below that. So while it's a lot of it dollars, it's an expensive project, it will take some time. It is still a relative bargain. And the uh, other benefits of mobility, uh, uh, environmental, uh, and economic are, are off the charts with, with our project. The last element that we had to update in the project update report is, the, is a ridership analysis. Uh, we started a ridership analysis update with the California State Transportation Agency who puts out the state rail plan uh, and our transit uh, partners, at ACE and uh, San Joaquin's, uh, as well as Caltrans who oversees the inner city rail program for the state of California. And so we've updated our ridership uh, estimates and uh, we use those to build our scenario for Merced to Bakersfield. Um, and so uh, I'm gonna show you in a moment that ridership and transit ridership in California is generally down and we are not immune from those impacts. It, it, it affects us as well. Even though we are not a current operator, when we estimate what our ridership will be, we are informed by what's going on uh, now in the real world. And we are seeing this pressure everywhere. Here in Sacramento, there will be a robust conversation in the legislature this year about what they're calling the transit operational funding cliff. And what that generally means is transit operators up and down the state saw a huge impact when COVID struck. Those ridership numbers have not come back and they're seeking operational funding help. And so they'll be in Sacramento talking a lot about that. Again, we not, we're not immune from those impacts. Um, there are three drivers to the ridership changes that I'm going to uh, go through. One of them is population uh, rates in California. Again, we're, we're projecting this out going forward, and population rates in California are much lower, more stagnant than they were. There was a time when California was going to have about 50 million people by 2040. That number today is 42 and a half. The total employment packages um, uh, in California in terms of total employment and new jobs is a fall, uh, fallen back a little bit from where it was in 2020. It's back to about a 2018 or 2016 uh, element. So there's an impact on ridership there. Our model does a better job at looking at travel behavior. Uh, would somebody drive to a train station, get in a train if it's far away versus, uh, versus just driving? And so we have a well, more realistic view of uh, travel uh, behavior in this modeling. And then the last thing is because we are connecting to ACE and Amtrak, for example, in the uh, uh, Central Valley, uh, the, the, the reduction in commuter ridership in California post COVID uh, is lingering. And uh, part of that is uh, while people are still employed, they're not going to the work necessarily five days a week as they were before, they're going fewer. And so transit ridership has been impacted by that in part. So our numbers will reflect that while our numbers are down, it's important to note that ridership by building our system in the Central Valley will be 70% higher than the non-build alternative. That travel by train along the segment in the Central Valley still reduces travel time by 90 to 100 minutes. We have uh, greenhouse gas reduction benefits by electrifying that corridor. And the ridership for Silicon Valley to Central Valley in phase one segments still provide robust uh, uh, transit, or sorry, train uh, riding corridors. So our next steps on this, these are preliminary numbers, which I'll jump into in a minute, but our next step is to work with our partners to right size the service plans, to make sure there's a full agreement on the ridership estimates, modernize fare plans, and, and integrate service and execute uh, several agreements, operating agreements. And as we do that, we'll be updating where we are in the 2024 business plan. This is a picture of uh, that, that impact on the ridership I mentioned uh, just for the Merced to Bakersfield a stretch in our business plan. Uh, and in 2019, we estimated that not building in the Valley, they would have about 3.97, that's is on the left, 
7 million riders a year with our system, it would jump up to about 8.78. Uh, under the new projections, they would have about 3.88 with a no build scenario in the valley. And with ours, it would jump up to 6.61. So again, while we're seeing reduced uh, ridership, we're still seeing important benefits from building the Central Valley uh, system. But this is the valley to valley picture. And again, um, you see that reduction in the ridership, but there's an a important note here. We were in the business plan about 18.4 million in year one of valley to valley. That estimate now is at 11.5 or 11.49. Um, and just to put some context to this, again, while it's reduced, the busiest passenger rail corridor in America today for inner city rail is the Northeast corridor in New England. And that carries about 12 million riders a year. And that's the busiest corridor in the country. So again, building Valley to Valley in year one, you would be on par with the busiest passenger rail corridor in the country. And because of the travel reduction times, you would see growth in our system uh, beyond those early years. But this is, again, these are preliminary numbers. We're gonna do a lot of refinement with these with our partners over the course of the next several months and report further in our business plan. But we are, yeah, in the 2024 20, business plan, but I did wanna report what we're seeing right now, which again is industry-wide. Uh, in California and around the country. Uh, this is a picture of the phase one system. And again, we had es estimated before about 38 and a half million riders in the first year of phase one. Now we're at 31.3 uh, roughly. And again, if you consider that the busiest passenger rail corridor in the country right now carries about 12 million inner city uh, travelers a day, this is you know two and a half times that for the phase one uh, system. The other thing that's important to note that I, I didn't say earlier, but just about transit ridership and what we're seeing right now, um, the, the core issue is more on commuter and local transit, uh, people taking it to work typically. Longer distance trips like air travel or longer distance train trips, that ridership is more stable. Uh, it has come back further from COVID and that our, our analysis shows that as well. And I think anybody who's been to an airport would see that air travel is pretty robust again. So is it still the right option for California? Obviously we think it is. Our, our initial operations will cut travel times uh, in half, reducing those Central Valley trips by 90 to 100 minutes. We have a higher projected ridership than really all of the supported Amtrak uh, services combined in California right now that carry about 5.6 million riders. Again, 6.6 .6 million would be carried in the first year of the Merced to Bakersfield uh, stretch. And when, again, when we compete or complete California high-speed rail, we'll look, be looking at carrying about 31 million riders a year, which is significantly more than the highest inner city uh, corridor in the country today. So um, I'm not giving you a lot of great news, um, and it's, it, but it's, it is what it is. But I, I do wanna say that it's, it's important that we don't lose, fact of, uh, or lose sight of what we're doing and the advancements that we are making on this project. Uh, we've covered and cleared now 422 miles of the 500 miles that we need to clear to go from San Francisco to LA and Anaheim. By the end of 23, we'll clear the Palmdale to Burbank environmental stretch, and we'll be at 465 miles cleared. Uh, the 119 miles that are currently under construction in summer of 23, we'll have substantial completion of CP4. Right away is 96% done, utility re relocations are moving. We have started advanced design into Merced and Bakersfield. 171 miles will be in construction or advanced design this year, it already is. Uh, and we have station design, four stations uh, being designed now through the contract the board approved earlier this year for Merced, uh, for Fresno, for Kings Tulare and for Bakersfield. So again, we continue to move forward. And of course, just the other day, the Chairman Richards and I and others celebrated the 10,000 jobs created on this project, which will continue uh, to grow as we, we move the project forward. By the fourth quarter of this year, the design for the Bakersfield to Merced extensions will reach the configuration footprint, and we'll have a very good sense of what right away needs we have to do so we can commence that work. 2026 is the year of completion for CP1 and CP23 uh, construction elements in the Central Valley as well. Coming to the end of this, I promise. Um, again, so what's important for us now going forward with these cost estimates? Um, there is no permanent funding program in place for high-speed rail nationally or here in California. As we stand here today, uh, we have a cap and trade commitment through 2030 with an expiration date in 2030. 
and for a project that's going to last for years, uh, for decades really, and is going to cost a, you know, a bit to build, uh, it's important for us that we ultimately address the issue of what do we do beyond 2030. Um, I think before we have that conversation, we do want to make sure that we are uh, we are strong with our federal partner, and we have a full and committed federal partner to getting our work done. To date, the federal government has contributed about three and a half billion to this project, and the state has paid the rest, and so it's an 85, 15% cost share. And what we're trying to do now is work hard with our federal partner to uh, do what we said we were going to do in the IIJA pass, which is work hard to compete in these six different federal programs that total about $75 billion nationally to achieve roughly $8 billion out of federal funds uh, to move this project forward. And I wanna be clear, we will need those dollars to build Merced to Bakersfield. And we want to establish that, that those federal dollars are here, I think before we have additional conversations about what to do beyond 2030. And so that's important. Uh, Brian Annis, our grant team and our federal team have been working closely with me in consultation with the Federal Railroad Administration uh, on working through a phased approach to federal funding where we outline for them now where and what we would be applying for, how we would use those dollars, and over the course of the next five years, how the project would grow with the benefit of those federal funds. So I think I have a, a graphic uh, display here to sort of show them. There's a lot going on in this display, so let me walk you through this a little bit. But this is something that we've shared with the FRA and they've been very uh, welcoming of it. Uh, along the top are in that blue box are the phases of project development. Environmental is the first phase, advanced design, right of way, uh, final design, civil construction, track and systems, the second track and then train sets. And what you can see here is the dark green is where things are completed. And if you look down that left column, you see Merced, Madera, Fresno, Kings, Poplar and Bakersfield. That's from North to South. Uh, our segment in the Central Valley. And you can see we're building out from the middle because we are, we are in the 119 mile stretch now. And so we're through final design for sure and into construction, funded uh, construction and funded the first track and systems for the 119. So that dark green and light green is either completed or funded. And so our first application to the federal government is, is all that area that is letter A in kind of that brown uh, color, if you will, um, that is how our first uh, application would be uh, uh, submitted to the federal government later this year so that we can uh, expand right of way and early work toward Merced, expand right away and early work toward Bakersfield. Uh, we would do track and systems second track that would uh, be the second track for all of Madera uh, to Poplar Avenue. And then we're also pursuing funds for train sets so that we can move forward on, on train set procurement. Uh, that's phase one. Phase two would be in 2024. Uh, and that is, it's on this, it's kind of a the white color. It's the, the B section, which is where we pursue federal funds for the civil works to get to downtown Merced. Uh, and then the last is, or second to the last is phase C in 2025, where uh, future federal funds we would pursue for civil construction of the Merced station to Bakersfield and for the track and systems all the way to Merced. So this is just a way that we've communicated with the FRA on how we would use grants uh, going forward to ultimately build out the uh, Merced uh, to Bakersfield system. And you can see in this from the green that most of the 119 where we have funding to get most of that, to get that work done, it's really bringing the federal government to help us get the Merced to Bakersfield pieces done. This has been well received by the FRA and we're having very uh, productive conversations with them about this approach. I should say one other thing. We will not have to wait a long time to know whether we have a full federal partnership uh, with, with the federal government on this project. Uh, we, as things stand right now, we have uh, $300 million in grants pending there. Uh, Brian Annis mentioned this at the FNA report this morning, uh, but that 300 million is for grade separations to start a little bit south in, in through the city of Shafter for grade sep, uh, grades, about six grade separations there. Uh, and, Right on the heels of that in April, our first major grant application under the federal state program will be submitted where all these letter A's on this chart will be in that federal grant request. And that'll go to the uh, federal government in April and we expect that they will award uh, likely by the end of the year. So we will know in 2023 where we stand uh, with the federal partnership uh, on this program. 
Uh, again, uh, uh, Chairman uh, Richards and I were in Fresno the other day. We were joined by FRA Administrator Edmeet Bose. And, you know, I, I know there was uh, recent press coverage on a grant we did not get. That was not entirely a surprise to us because the uh, USDOT made a decision to uh, just do that grant cycle for one year. We had applied for multiple years. Uh, but as the FRA Administrator informed uh, all of us in Fresno the other day that this project from their perspective is unparalleled and the federal government will continue to partner with California to deliver this project and they will stand shoulder to shoulder with the workers in the cities of California to deliver this particular project. He was asked specifically about the mega grant and whether that is a foreshadowing of, of uh, future rejections for us. And he said, I don't think in any way it's a reflection of the federal commitment to the California high-speed rail project. The pot that California uh, that the California in particular is paying close attention to is the federal state partnership project, $12 billion or pot, $12 billion a program over the next five years. And as he noted, that's a really good opportunity. So again, it's important that we have a strong federal partner. We're gonna need it uh, to build this segment uh, and the project update report will go through uh, all of that and uh, what, we're, what we're doing working with the federal government on this. So lastly, with all this stuff, what are our goals and what do we do? How do we go forward on this? Um, you know, we still have targeted goals that we wanna to reach to achieve our passenger service. We have a full commitment to get the 119 miles done with the federal money that we do have. We are fully committed to complete the environmental work everywhere, which is a requirement of our federal uh, partner. And we're fully committed to our local partners on the bookend projects that we've funded. So that will continue. Our schedule looks like this, track and systems RFQ. Uh, we want to come back and talk about that beginning in 2023. Potential train set procurement as early as 24, 119 mile double track electrified by 28, passenger service between Merced and Bakersfield in that schedule window between 2030 and 2033. And again, to be clear, all of the work outside of the 119 miles, we will need our federal partner on. And so we, we got to see uh, how that comes out in uh, this year. In terms of outside the Central Valley, we will reach full environmental uh, clearance for all 500 miles by 2025. All segments from SF to Anaheim, we have an opportunity to advance that design work. So we know what it's gonna take to build all of phase one. And, uh, and uh, our goals, clearly these goals necessitate that full federal uh, funding partnership that we, we talked about and that we're working on. Um, I think for this part of the a presentation, I'll pause here and happy to answer any questions uh, from board members uh, at this point before I go into the rest of the CEO update. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Uh, any, uh, at this point, any questions or comments from uh, members of the board? I, I have some questions, Mr. Chairman. Yes, please go ahead, Director Scusha. Thank you. Um, On page six of your slide presentation, uh, Brian, uh, the cost outcomes, and I know that there's obviously a lot of supply side issues, inflation and whatever. Um, does these, do these cost outcomes include the change orders that have basically, you know, are part of CP1 as well as CP23, et cetera? Yeah, the short answer to that is they do. It's an estimate that includes not just the cost of change orders uh, executed, but an estimate of, uh, based on history, what change orders have become. So part of that is uh, an estimate of known change orders and some contingency for what might be unknown change orders. But all of that is part of that probability 65 risk contingency. And, and, what, and, and, and on that P65, can you explain to me what that is? Yeah, fundamentally, I think the simplest way to say it is, you know, we run, uh, scenario models, we do a different kind of uh, what's called a Monte Carlo analysis for, we did it on the uh, area where, where we know the most, which is the, the 119 miles. And then we do a, a top-down uh, estimate with all of our risk es experts on what the cost will be beyond the 119 uh, miles. And what you get to with the probability number is this is the probability that the budget you establish will cover. Uh, essentially the cost of doing that program. So it's a 65% probability with that budget that we would cover, cover those costs. And that is the level that the FRA recommends it for a mega project at our, at our stage. 
Okay. Now I understand when I first came on this board three years ago that the ARA agreement, the condition to get those ARA funds, was to basically build out first the those 119 miles, which is I guess the test track. Now you're telling me that we do have money for that right now in our bank account. We have money to do that. Yeah, we do for the 119 miles. We really need the federal help for the extension parts beyond that. Um, and uh, also, I think, you know, probably a, when you started, the, the technical delivery date uh, with the FRA was, was out of date on, on the requirements to get the 119 miles done. So that's been renegotiated, and, and the delivery date for that 119 miles is now December 31st of 2028. So we we now have uh, time to get that finished. And we have a, a budget that we estimate now that we have to do that. All right. Now, this ridership data analysis, it scares me because yeah. I remember being on the Senate floor with Senator Quentin Kopp, and there was a discussion about this project not being subsidized, you know, and so obviously, you know, we had to ensure that the ridership data was as accurate as possible. And now you're saying that that ridership data is being analyzed, it's being amended. So I'm expecting that it's going to go down, um, even as a result of say demographic changes. You know, I think I read somewhere in the paper today that 500,000 Californians are leaving California. So if the ridership data goes down, how does that, does that add costs to the project? Um, the ridership, one, the ridership data as we're reflecting is showing a downward trend and it does take into account those demographic uh, changes that I, uh, I discussed. What, what, we'll, what we'll need to do is a couple of things. One, if the demand for the transit is lower, you do have to look at how, how might you shift your service plan um, and how might you shift your fare, uh, uh, fare structure because you can, uh, in so doing, you can reach sort of a sweet point between uh, number of riders and revenue generated. And so there will be some shifting that we'll have to do, uh, optimizing of the system that we'll have to do uh, to accommodate all that. That work is, is gonna be done in partnership with our partners and that's still in front of us. We'll report on that in the 2024 uh, a business plan. So um, we still, and I'll just say this about the subsidy issue. Um, it's true that for the full phase one system, the, the bond bill says, the program shouldn't be subsidized, but even at the lower ridership estimate we see now, uh, 31 and a half million riders between San Francisco and uh, the Bay Area, uh, we think that is still going to be a net uh, operating surplus uh, system. And then lastly, you know, um, I'm just going back now to my days of assembly uh, vice chair for the transportation committee and, and my work on Alameda Corridor and my exposure to the uh, ubiquitous change orders. Yeah, um, I would love to, you know, just for my edification, to to get, you know, uh, a very a very small chart, very small email that identifies CP one. What was the money that was originally bid for it, which I think was slightly under one billion, and how much money have we actually paid out yeah. for it as a result of change orders, and then segregate the type of change order because I know that some change orders are legitimate, some of them I don't know. And some of them are our fault because of the right of way problem. Can I get that information with regard to CP1 as well as CP23? Yeah, we do report a picture of that each month to the FNA committee, but I could, um, but I'm happy to just uh, extract put, the put information. A, just yeah, give I'm it happy to, to put a compendium together of those impacts for each of the CPs. I can make that available to you. Yes. And so it's my understanding that the way these change orders operate is that you and, and high-speed rail staff basically negotiate, you know, um, I guess the value uh, of the change order. And I guess what I'm trying to say is that I'm very concerned that we have an outstanding liability out there in terms of these change orders that runs in the close to $10 billion, if not more, and that scares me. Well, let me, let me say this. First of all, as I said earlier, um, many of the change orders, uh, the, particularly the larger ones, are tied to uh, scope changes since the contract was let. And so when scope is significantly changed and you have to uh, make physical changes to the project, then we have to negotiate that. 
Uh, the right-of-way issue, having been behind on right-of-way for so long, did cause some contractor delay, and we've had to pay for that too. Right. But we have a very clear change order process that, again, that we've talked about with this board before, and I'm happy to uh, rebring back to the board, but essentially it involves bringing in, it goes through a, a first a merit determination that is it involves our commercial team, as well as uh, our, our folks who are working on the ground. And then depending on the cost of the change order, it goes through a higher escalation of approval within the authority. And change orders at a certain level uh, do come to me. As I indicated before, we had a couple of large commercial settlement issues on all of the CPs, which we've talked with the board about that you know are, are in the category of $100 million issues. And as I said at the outset of this, we've settled almost all of those now. We're down to one left in arbitration on CP23. And we've just settled the last one on CP, uh, CP1. So yeah, that, that history and that picture is not pretty. And it's not the way you want to run a, any kind of a mega project. But the good news is the way we are approaching the Merced and Bakersfield extensions, uh, getting the right of way done first, uh, getting the design uh, dragged out further so that we can complete that, that right of way work, complete the utility relocations before you get into construction. You eliminate or greatly reduce the need for uh, massive scope changes later uh, or any delay tied to not having the right of way complete. So the way we're approaching the extensions, I think, will uh, result in less of the problematic history that we've seen. No, I understand that the that the picture is not pretty. I just would hope that that you know you would understand that the board you know listen you know we're very busy people at times we don't concentrate you know I would love to get a primer on change orders again yes. to refresh my memory on this because yep. eventually I'm assuming that I have to vote on this to approve the the payment of a change order or not right some, we have to vote on this some some, some? not all of them right. not all of them right so which ones do I have to approve well, is we adopt, we adopt well, under the delegation of, thor of authority, again, and we can go through this at a future hearing if you want, but when we, at the delegation of authority that was uh, given to the management team that we, you know, depending on the level of, of, of change order, we, we can settle several of those. And then uh, the larger ones that go beyond the authorized budget that the board sets for us, we do have to come to the board and get approval of those. And what's the authorized budget? Uh, it what's depends the on the CP. They're all, they're, they're different based on uh, where we are, um, uh, I, I, the number off the top of my head, I got to look at, but uh, you, you set a budget for us to complete the work for right. the Central Valley. And, and as the change orders, it, unless we execute a change order that exceeds that, um, we definitely have, we have delegated authority to approve those. So I will say that with our cost estimates going forward, we will be coming back soon to extend that authorized budget. But then we have a level of change order approval that starts at you know, a million gets one level of review, 10 million gets a level of review, 25 million gets a level of review that comes up through the management. When we exceed the authorized budget for any change order, we come back to the board for that approval. And as you know, I report all change orders to the board each month that exceed $25 million. All right. Yeah, I remember that figure, 25 million. Okay. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you. Any other questions at, the, at this point for our CEO? I have a couple. Yes, I, I have Correct. a question too. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted Director to, um, just so I'm clear, there's a lot of information that we've received. And thank you, Brian and staff, for all the hard work you've done in putting this together. Um, you know, we so we have an approved business plan that this board forwarded on a year or so back, and this is a CEO report. So you're not obviously asking us for our approval or blessing of, of what you're gonna be submitting to the state legislature and governor? No, the, the nature of the project update report is to, is particularly this one, because as I said earlier, there's new statutory requirements. Correct. Okay. What's in it, but the nature of this is just to provide an update to the legislature on the status of the program. Correct. So our previously approved business plan stands as an it official does stand, document? But this okay. is the update to that. All right. But we and will be back just so you know, we will be back with a 2024 a business plan as well because we do those every even year. okay and uh, member scooter if i could just answer one of your questions the um I, I met with our fresno uh director last week just to get an update on some information and <clears throat> the answer to your question the cp1 was less than a billion dollars and today we stand at about three billion dollars in expenditure for cp1 so you know costs have gone up 
but but what I what I did, Brian, there's so many, I guess, areas I'd like to touch, but I'll just touch one, Mr. Chairman. Maybe this is more for you. Um just the one thing that, that I asked staff to take a look at because there's so many pieces to getting to when is the train gonna run? Yeah. And I, I know now we're we're saying by the end of the decade. And in my mind, you work path back from on a critical path to say, well, what are all the things that need to happen sequentially to make sure that we get there? And the only, the one area I pulled out was on third party issues. Yep. And the staff did a great job in putting together information and, and sending me that data. And I asked them to forward this document to the rest of the board members too, because it's something we should all be interested in. I hope hope everybody got it. But but what I wanted to to emphasize, Mr. Chairman, is uh, I mean, when, when you look at the, just looking at the numbers for PG&E, just as an example, we have a total of 306 utility issues on CP1, 133 have been completed, 29 are in progress, and 144 have not yet been started. And so now I tie that back to our new date of completing CP1, which will be in 2026. I don't know if it's beginning of 26 or the end of 26, but let's just say we're, you know, two and a half, three years away from that. So in my mind, knowing at least for the last three, four years that I've been on this board, the major issues we have been having with AT&T, PG&E, uh, the railroads, the uh, telecommunications folks, I'm just trying to wrap around in my mind what has changed, especially in working with PG&E and, uh, and the railroads that would make us think that they are going to be more amenable to, to helping us meet our timelines, number one. And uh, number two, I know that we have a tentative agreement with the, with the uh, builder on the schedule, on this schedule, and that's being negotiated now. But assuming we don't meet these timelines, and of course, we're gonna be talking about change orders, it's gonna increase the cost for not just CP1, but I'm sure we would have a similar discussion on the other CPs. So what I'm asking, Mr. Chairman, uh, I think as, as one board member, I've always felt that we've been in a position to, to react, but not react proactively because we get information or these things happen and it's too late for us to do anything other than to change the, the dates and to pay the change orders. So what I'm asking is maybe this format, the very simple format that was sent to me, if maybe that could be included as a page in, in your, uh, your report, F&A report, so that we can see as a board, okay, I know now that there are 144 not started with PG&E as an example. I'd like to be able to take a look at this in three months and say, is that still 144? And if it is, then I think we should be engaging a lot sooner as a board to say, how do we pivot to do something different than, than what we're doing now? So. Uh, I, I would say that uh, the answer is yes. The, I haven't seen what, what you've got, but um, that that detail would be helpful for finance yeah. and audit each month. And Brian and I spoke yeah. this morning, and he did have yeah. some some thoughts on Yeah, I mean, I, a couple of, couple of things. One, we do report it all at every finance and audit committee each month where we are in the utility relocations for each CP. We did not break we do not break them down like you have on that chart by utility. But as you can see on that chart, with respect to AT and T, we're well advanced. Uh, yep. PG and E, we got work to do. The irrigation utility districts were further advanced, and uh, uh, telecoms were 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 doing okay. And the the UP, we need approvals and some some additional help with what we've done as management matter is look there's no question we've got to move these third party agreements quicker yeah. so we can move these utilities and get into full construction so i've uh, just put in charge a new executive in charge of the uh of the third party agreement tasks um and we are now uh, ele elevating things quicker within the management team we've just mm -hmm. reached an agreement with at&t on some issues you're going to see when I report on other things in the CEO report, we're trying to settle a couple of the utility agreements with water districts to make sure CP4 uh, can get done. And so we have a keener focus on that. And we're talking now with agency and the administration about a broader focus to bring in some additional help to, to work through the third party issues because they have broader relationships, if you will, with, with some of those utilities. And, and so that's uh, something that we're in discussions with now. But we do have a new executive in charge of the third party agreement. 
uh, and we are working through those issues. I would just say, too, while it's been uh, slow, we've advanced quite a bit uh, compared to where we were yeah, on these. Mm -hmm. We do report them every month to the FNA, and if you want to buy utility, we can we can provide it that way. Yeah, that'd be great because I think it yeah. would it would really help this board yeah. get a real good view yeah. of what's happening yeah. at that level. Thank you, them. Thank, Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Director Perea. Any other uh, questions or comments for the uh, CEO right at this point? Uh, Hearing none. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Two I think we've got uh, Director, Director yep. Williams. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, so, uh, Mr. Kelly, Brian, thank you so much for that, um, taking so much time in your um, CEO report to update us on the project update report. I think it's helpful not only for this board, but for the public to understand, um, you know, some of the challenges that we have been facing. Um, I really do appreciate how you laid out, um, you know, back, you know, I too wanted to go back to slide number six as Director Scutia did, um, you know, where those cost drivers are. Um, and, but also before I go into that, just appreciate being reminded of the historic nature of what we're trying to accomplish here and how that compares to what has has been done not only internationally but in the rest of the country that frankly doesn't compare to what we're trying to do um and so it's it's very helpful to have you recite that and to give us those comparisons to other projects in the in the u.s other projects internationally, and frankly, other modes of transportation that are also challenged and costly. Um, but but back to slide number six, and I think, again, appreciate um, good lawyers ask good questions, and Director Scuti has certainly asked some, some really good questions um, about those costs. I was curious, um, and, and maybe I'll just leave it as a comment is it because I, I think the questions have been asked and, and, and answered. But I think that what's really driving and what's behind it for me is having a better understanding of which of those costs we control uh, as a board and as an entity and as the you know, folks responsible for this project and which ones we don't. Some of them are formulaic, as you pointed out, with the, you know, the P65 calculation. Um, some of them we don't control in terms of inflation. Um, and supply chain issues, um, to some degree, even the uh, you know the scope changes um, make sense. Um, but I think it would be helpful for us going forward. And and what you heard, I think, from Director Escutia and Director Correa, is like us really focusing and drilling down on what we do control and how we can you know, how we must, frankly, do everything in our power to minimize those costs. Um, and whether it's getting ahead of those, what results in change orders, um, making sure we're doing the work and pushing our partners to um, to expedite what we can expedite and, and you know, having a, playing, playing to, to the degree that we can and where we can, a stronger hand in making that happen. So, um, I just, I don't really expect a response. Um, I think a lot of my questions were asked and answered, um, but I just wanted to pull back a few thousand feet and just emphasize that point and, and thank you and your team for all you're doing and just know that you have this board, um, not only our expectation, but our willingness to, to help push where we need to push to make sure that we are doing what we can to control those costs where, where we can. Thank you. Thank you, Director um, one, Williams. One comment I would just make in terms of um, re reducing the, the probability that we would see this going forward is to make sure that as we go forward, um, we, 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 we execute in, in sequence that is, that is right for projects like this. Um, we can't, again, you know, we're playing a lot of catch up and that is the problem fundamentally is that we are uh, we're finishing right of way after the contract is let. You know, we're finishing utility relocations after the contract is let for construction. We pay for that delay. Uh, and, and the good news is we don't have to repeat that going forward. And we're not going to. 
And so the, the key fundamental thing for me going forward is, and this has to do, everything has to do with what we are doing on the Merced and Bakersfield extensions. That, that is the place where we could show uh, getting the sequence right. We call it the stage, we call it the stage gate process or stage delivery process, but that's where we wanna see this going forward. We've heard a lot from industry about the size of contracts going forward. We probably need to have smaller contracts going forward that are more manageable and more efficient and execute it only when they're ready to get into construction. And so that's gonna be a key to a better future on this program. And we have to just finish cleaning up the past. And, and that is, and I wanna to say to the whole board, I welcome, I welcome the use of the board and board members to help us with these third party issues. Because once we gain, uh, once the contractor has access to the sites, we can advance the construction pace, but we gotta get them access to the sites by getting these pre-construction things done. And so that I welcome this dialogue. I welcome this opportunity. I think Thank Lynn, you. Lynn's go. Lynn. I think Chairman. Lynn's oh yes, yes, Director Shank. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you. Well, uh, so many of the uh, eloquent comments of my colleagues were uh, reflected what I wanna say, uh, questions that I wanted to, to ask. So I'm just going to uh, try to figure out how to do this. Uh, as Brian has pointed out, lots of mistakes in the past. And I guess as the resident historian, I will say that um, many of them were the fault of uh, those of us involved because you know, the unique project, historic project, never been done in the United States before. We were learning as we went along and uh, frankly, it was done on, on stage. So we had the dress rehearsal and the first performance all at the same time with the, the bright lights and the critics uh, in the audience. Uh, much of it predates Brian and this team. Some of it, you know, he, he's inherited, some new. It seems like the, the story has been uh, things changing. This has been, a, <laughs> if there's one thing we can say, it's change, whether change orders, uh, new issues, new people, uh, and almost like a restaurant check, when there's a mistake, it's never in the customer's favor. So the, the, the changes and mistakes have never really been in our favor, but we're looking ahead. And to me, nothing will be as important and, and show success as finishing the 119 miles. I think that everything else is important to plan for, but you know, we have limited resources, we have limited staff, we have limits, money limits, every kind of limit. I just wanna make the comment that, that, that I for one wanna do that laser-like focus on the 119 miles. Let's show California, let's show the American people we can get this done and uh, the rest will come. If we are successful, in doing the 119 miles, I really believe that uh, maybe in my lifetime, the rest will come. So uh, I just wanna echo what uh, uh, Martha, Anthony, Henry have said. Uh, Brian, I really appreciate this update. I think that uh, uh, the sooner we can get these, this kind of information, the better for all of us to get on the same page to help you and uh, your, your entire team uh, help get this 119 miles completed. Thank, Thank you. you, Director Shank. Anybody else? All right. Uh, I'm not going to belabor the comments because they, they've all hit them, but quite clearly what we can do as a board and have to do, and in fact, uh, will be, we, we have to set the policy and the policy is to um, determine what we do and when, and we do what we, we do things when we have, when we're ready to do them. So we know what happened before. We had an unrealistic requirement to spend a lot of money from the federal government uh, that happened to be by September of 2017, which is the reason, as, as uh, Director Shank uh, alluded to, why we got out of sequence because we had to start construction in order to meet that deadline or all of the money would have been sent back to the Washington. 
So we did all those things. In addition to the thing that hasn't been mentioned, we also had to survive a number of, of lawsuits, all of which we did, but it cost time and it cost money and delay. So that's what happened. So what we do in the future is to implement those things that you've talked about, uh, Brian, and, and those things are, we don't do anything out of sequence. But what we also cannot do is we can't advance a project without a definition of where the revenue is coming from. And uh, Lou Thompson, who had, who's chaired the, the peer review group as long as I've been on the board, has said this at literally every public hearing I can recall having uh, been at or listened to him or read in the newspaper as he defines the major issue with the California High Speed Rail project. And that is a commitment to provide the revenue in order to complete it. And that's that along with a commitment not to move out of out of step with what we are prepared to do to move forward on uh, makes it so you the 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 um, contingency requirement or can be substantially reduced because there are so fewer unknowns. So I, I am very very pleased with what you've done today, Brian, uh, in terms of the detail, and I know this is just a, a, a briefing, so this isn't at all, but I think it captures exactly where we are, how, not so much how we get, got there, but I think we, through this discussion, we know how we got here, but we need to engage not just our federal partners, but also our California partners, also the legislature. We need to sit down, uh, formally or informally, but we've got to make, we've got to have a common commitment. And that is that there's got to be a way, to, a pathway that we can all rely upon that you can be charged with the responsibility of moving the project forward because the funding is committed. And I Mr. heard, we heard, a, we heard a bit of that two days ago in Fresno from the, uh, from the administrator of, of the FRA and from the undersecretary, our assistant, assistant secretary of the department of transportation they all get it so it's i think we're we're at a we are at a uh, time in which it the parties i think recognize we all got to come together and if they're going to charge us with the responsibility we have got to work with them so that we've got the financing to do it mr chairman mr chairman, I... mr. chairman? yes uh, director scusha yes um, I appreciate that, that, you know, obviously I think that I'm very conservative in terms of finances. I will not move unless I see really a realistic path to drawing down the money. Mm -hmm. So therefore, that's why I do agree that we really ought to pay strong, strong attention to what uh, Commissioner Schenk indicated. And that is that we really should focus, you know, on building the 119 miles honor a commitment to ARA, you know, and hopefully, you know, success breeds success, yeah. you know, that will bring down additional funds. But speaking about, about federal funds, it is very difficult to compete, you know, against other projects across the country. Um, and, you know, short of having Brian or you every day on Capitol Hill, I don't know how we do this. And so therefore I am just wondering, has the time come for us to perhaps consider hiring a lobbyist to make sure that, that we have boots on the ground on this issue consistently in Capitol Hill, consistently with the Federal Transportation Authority and Railroad Authority and all the people so that we know that we mean business in terms of drawing down the federal the next tranche of federal funds? If I Sure. I, I, were you going to talk yeah, about well, Mark? Yeah, uh, well, just, uh, just for edification, we, we do have... Yeah, we do. We do have federal representation in, oh. in we, Washington. We have two yeah. very good people, uh, Martha. And um, I, I mean, I've had an opportunity to watch uh, and I see the connection that they have with the people who are sitting across, across the table. Now, I'm, I'm very comfortable with the representation that we've got right now. And okay, it is there. I was there. not aware of that. Okay. No, but I mean, I think it's something we should never overlook either. 
but I think that we've got the right people try, there trying to make the case for us. I think it's part of what we're, and we're working very closely with them right now. And also remember, Mr. Chairman, uh, Lynn Shank is a former Congresswoman. You know, I'm sure she has access to some of those offices. I would say 50% of the California delegation are former assembly members or state senators that I served with. Yeah. So we have access to those type of offices. And, you know, we have to start considering, you know, um, using our resources, our connections mm -hmm. to push this project forward. Yeah. I also think that's a good idea. And I, I, I know that uh, Director Shank and I have talked about this and you've now in, in, involved yourself in it. So um, I won't be out of, out of line with just two people. So uh, we'll, we'll have that conversation. <laughs> Okay. Thanks, Martha. <laughs> well, got, thanks, you'll, Lynn. You'll have, you, know? you'll have, you both have another assignment coming forward. Oh, okay. Lord. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I, I just would say that, that one, you know, the, the, the laser like focus on the 119 is absolutely the right. It's exactly right the We've right term. A, it's, it's what we owe the federal government. They've mm -hmm. gave, given us three and a half billion dollars to deliver that. Yes. And so we have to get that delivered. That is the beginning point. But, but we also got to be, we got to be real clear. The 119 miles is what we're asked to build first. It is not a good operational run. That's right. It is a good test run. Yeah. Right. The operational run must connect the cities. It right. must connect the cities of the valley. And it's true that we cannot achieve that without federal help. The good news is that federal partnership will be established in 2023 mm -hmm. because the application is now. The award is this year. Mm -hmm. I, I will take everybody up on their relationships to to make that happen uh, because we're going to need to. So we will put the grant application together. And once it's out, I'll call on everybody and all, uh, to, to help us get that because we're yeah. going to need it to have a, a good operational, a good, a good operational yeah. run. So I, I do appreciate those coming. And then one last thing, and then I'll, sure. I'll, I'll be quiet is this, you know, I want to be clear on something. I've said that I've talked about the past because the past gives us a picture of what the future needs to be. And I'm, I'm dedicated <clears throat> to that future. Uh, but I also want to say, look, I've been here a while, and we need to do better. Uh, I need to do better. This team needs to do better in terms of delivering the uh, this utility work, get it done, get it out of the way so we can get to access for the contractors on construction. That is the path to advancing construction. I own that now. I own that. So I've made some changes with my management team. We are focused on those third party agreements and our objective is to get to construction sooner. And that, that's what we will do. Excellent. Thank you. All right, uh, we can now move on with the balance sure. of your uh, report. God, I gotta keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, this is now moving into the more traditional part of the CEO report, which is just an update on program uh, activities. Uh, the first one is that uh, we did get approval, for, speaking of third parties, <laughs> from recent approval for a design uh, for uh, advancement on the intrusion protection barrier. Uh, this is significant. This is about $40 million of work uh, that has been awaiting design approval and agreements with UP. Uh, those are done, and this work will commence in the next 10 days on CP1. Uh, and so we're very pleased that we've advanced that uh, part of CP1. And again, we'll see that work uh, move now that that design uh, approval has been completed. Um, the next one is uh, on CP4. We talked about this at the uh, FNA committee today. Um, CP4 schedule is awaiting the uh, conclusion of two utility agreements so that we can pick up the pace on work in the in Kern County. This has to do with uh, work we have on land owned by and affecting equipment by Semi Tropic Irrigation District and the North Kern Water District. That, that those agreements need to conclude and we are working to conclude those this month. We also have what's called prescriptive agreements, which are land right agreements between BNSF and the North Kern Water District that we are negotiating now. And those need to conclude. So uh, while we advance some of the work on the physical structure, there's a requirement to tie in uh, the, this, this canal work that we're building on Semi-Tropic. This agreement needs to be done so we can do the tie in work. And that this work is, is, is also something that we got to complete to get the CP4 schedule done. We got pushed back a little bit by heavy rains in December and January, but we're still looking at a CP4 substantial completion date at the end of Q2 
or, or perhaps the very beginning of Q3, uh, June or July of this year. And so again, uh, CP4 will reach substantial completion uh, in the very near future. Uh, we have some uh, contract extensions because we've extended the, the work for the contracts, uh, the work for the, uh, the CP work to conclude on CP1 and 2, 3. Our construction management teams, their work needs to extend. So we've extended each of these contracts uh, by two years. It's Wong Harris on CP1. That two-year extension is $66 million. And again, uh, that's part of the per, per, uh, uh, construction management team uh, work that we're completing. And uh, when we push out that schedule, we got to we maintain the PCMs here for continuity of, of, of management. And so that's uh, with the uh, schedule pushed out a couple of years, we push out the contract as well. So that's on CP1. There's a similar one on CP4. We just executed, this was also reported this morning at the FNA committee, but we has executed a change order for, again, those scope changes I talked about, agreements between the city of Fresno and UP on several bridges in downtown Fresno, agreements made between 2015 and 2018. All of that design work is now done. That change order is executed and uh, this work uh, can now move forward with the execution of this change order. It was a $74 million change order, but again, to get all of the scope changes that were in uh, from agreements in prior years into the contract. And this has been executed uh, the, and since we last met. Uh, next is similar to what I said earlier about the Wong Harris contract. Uh, we extend the work uh, for CP23 and we extend the contract for the construction management team we work with down there uh, to get uh, halfway through 2024. We'll continue to evaluate their work in the meantime before we make any decision on an, on an additional extension. Uh, I wanted to uh, inform the board, we haven't met since November and um, we didn't have a meeting in December or January. And there has been some important personnel changes that I wanna talk about because uh, there's additions to the team that are going to help us advance the work and uh, get the uh, construction done. And I'm very pleased to uh, talk about the appointment of Bill Casey who is coming in as our new chief operating officer. Uh, Bill has worked for years and years at uh, Caltrans and overseeing uh, complex construction projects. He was a guy that I got to know when he was part of a team that turned around the construction on the Bay Bridge, which had struggled for years. Bill was a guy who became part of the answer uh, to that problem. And uh, we're looking forward to welcoming him, him in later this month as our chief operating officer Bill is essentially the head of construction for the authority, and that position has been vacant for some time, but uh, been appointed earlier this month, and we're happy to welcome uh, Bill to the authority. Another appointment is a gentleman that you heard from earlier today, who I got to say takes a stunning picture. Um, uh, <laughs> Bruce Armistead is yeah, as, he cool, looks pretty as, good. as cool as could be. Yeah, uh, Bruce, I'm very pleased to uh, announce is our uh, new uh, confirmed and sworn in and appointed uh, chief of rail operations. And you all heard from him today. Uh, so pleased to have Bruce in that position. He's been with us for some time as the deputy chief for that position, but he's a well-earned this title and I'm looking forward to working with Bruce in the days ahead. Can congratulations, Bruce. Well-deserved. Uh, really happy for you. Yeah, thank you. And I'm struggling to move, there we go. And uh, uh, Assisting Bruce will be his deputy, uh, Dominic Rulins, who has 38 uh, years of experience in design and construction of railways and particularly high-speed rails, uh, ways internationally. Um, he is now coming from the contractor side to be our uh, employee, our uh, chief deputy for the rail operations division. Um, he's been seven years with the authority. Again, a lot of international high-speed rail experience. He has a great French accent. And I look forward to him uh, testifying uh, before you guys sometime in the near future. So these are important additions. Before I move to the, the, the celebration that we just had yesterday, I do wanna talk about some departures because I also want the board to be aware of some changes that occurred uh, since we last met. Um, as we're bringing in Bill and Dominique and, uh, uh, and Bruce, um, we are also, uh, uh, we have a change at our director of environmental services. I know the board's very familiar with Serge Stanich. Yeah. At the end of January, Serge took a position in the private sector. Um, and so his deputy, Scott Rothenberg, will step into that position as an interim uh, matter for us right now. I can't say enough 
to this board about the tremendous work that Mr. Stanich did for the authority. I've been very proudly talking about all the environmental documents that we cleared and Serge was our lead on getting that work done. He got a wonderful opportunity and I certainly wish him the best of luck in that. And his well-trained deputy is going to uh, help us get through the last two environmental documents that we have uh, in front of us. But um, uh, Serge uh, left at the end of January. And then the other uh, departure are two more that I wanna talk about. Um, our director of engineering services, Brian Sutliff, also left for a private sector opportunity in the beginning of February. Uh, and I'm happy to announce, I'm sad to see Brian go, but uh, uh, happy to announce that I'll be bringing in uh, a longtime uh, impressive state engineer to fill that position as a, at least as an acting matter for us for some period of time. And that's Dr. Brian Maroney, who used to be the, the lead state engineer for all bridges and seismic upgrades of bridges throughout the state of California. And I'm looking forward to welcoming him uh, to this, uh, this organization. So those are some changes that um, I also want you to be aware of. And then the last one, might be an individual the board is not uh, had not had a lot of interaction with, but uh, Christine DeYoung is uh, somebody who served as the assistant to our prior chief operating officer, uh, has assisted our deputy uh, chief operating officer in a lot of capacity and you know communications between the Valley and Sacramento, making sure we're advancing things, filling positions down there that we need filled. Um, she's taken on a, a job at uh, CSU Bakersfield and is relocated. Uh, for that, uh, but Christine DeYoung did tremendous work for the authority. Um, she left us at the beginning of this earlier part of this month, and uh, she'll she has very large shoes to fill. And so we're gonna we're gonna work hard to get that that position filled as well. But I can't thank her enough uh, for the work that she's done for us. And then, with or without the graphics, just to conclude, uh, I I just want to say that it was the other thing was our celebration earlier this week, which others have referenced in testimony but it was a very good day for us to celebrate the 10,000 jobs milestone uh, in the Central Valley. The FRA administrator came out from Washington, D.C., as did the Deputy Assistant Transportation Secretary, Charles Small. Um, and we were very pleased with some of the things they said publicly about their position on this project, including uh, Meet Bo saying you stand shoulder to shoulder with California High-Speed Rail, uh, with the governor, with the California Department of Transportation to see this project get delivered. Uh, and Charles Small, the Assistant Secretary at USDOT, I talked about their, their commitment to partnering with the state to figure out uh, what the capital stack of funding will be uh, and to make sure that we work together to move this project forward. So again, uh, really good uh, shared partnership uh, opportunity for us. Mr. Chairman, you were terrific as the MC of the event. And um, uh, it was a, a great day. I look forward to more of those uh, going forward. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. That wraps up my okay. report. Brian, thank you for the report. Uh, it's just been terrific. Um, we'll move to the final uh, uh, item, which is just a, a quick update on the Finance and Audit Committee meeting uh, this morning. I will try to do this in two minutes. Um, the numbers that I'm uh, going to uh, provide to you today are for the uh, month of December 22. At that, uh, on December 31st, the authority had uh, $1.8 billion uh, in the bank. Uh, that does not include uh, the proceeds from the November cap and trade auction, which would add another 190 million to it. So roughly $2 billion were, were in the uh, uh, revenue stream, include most of which is already in the bank at the end of the year. Uh, we also had a cap and trade uh, auction yesterday. We don't have any re re, uh, any numbers on that yet. We will have something to say to you next month re regarding that. Uh, we also, uh, when we have access to commercial paper uh, in advance of when there's a for when there's a Proposition One A bond sale, uh, commercial paper was sold uh, just recently, uh, which generates about two hundred million dollars for the authority against the $4.2 billion uh, in Proposition 1A. The administrative budget, we report on that, and the major reason we do that is because of the restriction on the amount of money can, that can be spent for administra administration for this project, uh, statutorily imp imposed in Proposition 1A. Uh, the authority uh, has spent uh, $32 million 
uh, in administration, which is about 34.2% of the annual or the budgeted year, which ends in uh, the end of June of this year. Capital outlay, we spent uh, in the month of uh, December uh, 73.3 million, of which 48 and a half million were on our, for our design build contractors, CP1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, we have a total contingency remaining as of the end of the year of 1.273 billion. Uh, of that, the, report, the amount that is allocated at this point to the uh, construction packages is 357 million six hundred or 357.6 million. Um, in the Central Valley report, uh, number of uh, uh, people at our construction sites in the month of December was 964 workers on average per day. That was a decrease for, of 257 from the previous month primarily the result of the time of the year, the holidays, but uh, also uh, very much impacted by the weather. Utility re relocation status, we have uh, 23 relocations that were completed in the month of December. Um, I'll not go through those numbers. We heard a little bit about utility uh, relocations earlier on the uh, on the uh, CP prog construction progress, we and that that's stru structures in uh, CPs one through four, we have 93 structures. Uh, 69 structures have been uh, have been substantially completed or underway. Uh, guideway, there's 119 miles, as you've heard. 88 of those 119 miles are underway or substantially complete. And we had an amazing month of uh, right away delivery. There were 41 parcels in the month of, deliver, of December delivered to the design builder, our builders. And uh, as was mentioned earlier, we had 28 or 2,300 parcels that we are procuring for CP, CPs one through four, of which 2,208 have been, have been delivered. That's 96%, as Brian said earlier. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for staying with us. And um, we appreciate your attendance and those you, of you out listening and watching, thank you. We will uh, be back again on March the 16th of finance and audit, which will be at 8.30 in the morning and the board meeting will be at 11 o'clock. So with that, uh, again, thank you all and welcome Emily. And we're very, very happy to have you here. Uh, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.